have confidence in God? Listen to this. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 7. NIV translation says, Blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. Do you have confidence in God? Good. Do you have the confidence that he's at work in you every day? Hmm. Providing your needs? Meeting your faults and shortcomings? Enabling you to overcome temptations? Giving you guidance? Restoring your body to health? Hearing and answering your prayers? Right. Sustaining you through times of difficulty, which always come to people in different ways. Delivering you from the attacks of the devil. Filling you with joy and peace. We all need confidence in God. In order to have confidence in God, you have to decide whose report will you believe. Will you believe the message from the world, the flesh, or the devil? Or will you tune into the message of the Spirit of God and walk in agreement with it? See, it's a decision that we all have to make. Now, just about everywhere you look these days, you see signs of shortage. There's so much fear in people and just general despair. Did you ever notice when people get filled with the fear of lack, that they begin to hoard? They will do things they would never have done at other times. They get greedy. But the first thing we should do is remember we are not of this world. Do you believe that? I know we're living here temporary, but our world is up above. With the Father, Jesus. We're not governed by lack. But we believe that our God meets all our needs according to his riches in glory. That's Philippians 4, verse 19. Okay? Then this is the time to be a giver in your life, wherever you go instead of falling into a spirit of hoarding, which some people do. Now, the enemy's number one strategy is to get you all full of fear by trying to get you to doubt the truth of God's promises. But the Bible tells us in John 16, verse 13, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, and he will show you things to come. So, we believe that the body of Christ should be the most well-informed group of people alive on the earth today. The Bible warned us in the last days, yes, perilous times will come. Now, you will not be able to mentally reason it in your own mind what is happening all over the earth. Now, if you dwell on these things then you'll get over into the flesh and it will have a big effect upon your life. Now Luke 21 verse 26. God's word says that men's hearts, that's in your spirit, will fail them for fear of things that are coming on this earth. But we have his word that the Holy Spirit will show us the things to come. Now it's exciting to know how things are going to turn out. No other group of people has available to them what belongs to the body of Christ through the Spirit of God. That's good to know, isn't it? We are blessed, favored among men. Now, are you convinced that God keeps his word? Good. As you believe that he has a plan and a purpose for your life, do you think, yes, I know that for certain. Or maybe you think, well, sometimes it's hard for me to feel that way. Or I often get doubts in my mind. Now, the feelings and the thoughts of doubt in your mind are an obstacle to having confidence in God, isn't it? But the writer of Proverbs tells us very clear what that's all about. He said in Proverbs 3 verse 5, Lean not unto your own understanding 
and to trust with all your heart or in a being. Okay? See, it's not a matter of relying on what you think you know and having an attitude of faith that sticks with God's word, even when you encounter difficulties and setbacks. And we, we've all had moments like that, right? Okay. So don't rely just on the visible circumstances or what you think you know. If God has told you he will take care of your financial needs, then you should not be worried. Or if you're single and God has told you that he has someone for you, then don't be concerned about being alone, about meeting the right person if you're in that level. All right? Before you were saved, all you could understand was conveyed through the five senses that we have. But now you have the Spirit of God. Now Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 5, now it is God who has made us for this very purpose and has given us the Spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. And because of God's Spirit now residing in you, you now have the power to make a decision to ignore what the world is telling you and start believing what the Spirit is telling you, the Spirit of God, that is. Now, when the world has no money, God has a way. When disease is running rampant, God can still heal. Where there is no way, God promises he can make a way. Don't be moved by what you hear and see on the news media. Now, as I said before, the enemy's strategy is to keep you locked into a lifestyle of fear. So you will doubt God's promises. That's his most reliable weapon. That is the tactic he used to get Adam and Eve to disobey. This is the strategy that the devil tried on Jesus when he tempted him after a 40-day wilderness fast. The devil will try to get you to question the authority, the accuracy of what God has said and committed to us. Now, why does he do this? Okay? It's because God's word, God's promises, are your weapons against him. Faith in God's promises moves mountains, heals cancers, gets bills paid, restores marriages, and changes the world you live in. So the devil uses fear to try to neutralize the power he's made available to true believers. He will use fear that God's promises are not true. Now, people whose lives are not grounded in the principle of God's word may be courageous for a time. But when faced with hardship, they will do whatever they can to escape difficulties. People who do ground their lives on God's word, however, will be better able to deal with the adversity. Ultimately, they will overcome the problems, all right? But when the Bible is the basis for the decisions that you make in your life, you're building a foundation upon which you can build a life that will always be heading to overcoming. You will be an overcomer, amen? Now, many people suffer from a lack of confidence, and they live frustrating, unfruitful lives as a result. And that is the result. But we have all been created by God for greater things. Do you believe that? Well, if you've got somebody sitting next to you, tell them, God's got greater things for your life. Always. Now, you must be confident in who dwells in you, not in yourself. If God has called you to do something, it will continually enable you to do it. Hebrews 13.5 tells us, He has promised to never leave us, nor to forsake us. Praise God. Now, Satan works very hard attempting to steal our confidence. But we must resist him every time he tries. Now, the word of God gives us great confidence, and it is the devil who is always trying to steal it away from us, okay? 
Now, when we lack confidence, or when we are fearful, and sometimes we feel that we can't do something, we must recognize the source of these negative influences. It's not God who brings those thoughts and feelings, but Satan. Always. Now, there are times when people are tormented by all kinds of fears about themselves. Insecurities, past failures can steal people's confidence, and it does. Things may have been said about you. They may have affected how you feel about yourself. Those wounds can negatively affect your level of confidence. But the Bible is full of wonderful scriptures that will encourage you if you will begin to speak them. I'll just give you a couple, three maybe. Ephesians 6.10 says, Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Zechariah 4.6 says, It is not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. One more. Philippians 3.3, 3, take no confidence in the flesh. That's interesting, isn't it? Now, it's important that we understand the difference about being confident in ourselves and being confident in Christ and his word. Now, the Apostle Paul explains that in the book of Philippians, that before he knew Jesus Christ, he put all his confidence in his own fleshly ability to keep the law of Moses. But while Paul taught that that would make him a good person in God's eyes and that he would go to heaven, that's what they used to believe, in reality, his prideful self-confidence caused him to commit violence against those who did not believe what he believed. You do know that, don't you? Thank God God changed him. All right? Now, Jesus warns us in the Gospel of John 6, 63, it is the Spirit who gives life, the flesh profits nothing. It's interesting, isn't it? Now, in John chapter 15, verse 5, Jesus tells us, apart from him, we can accomplish nothing. So if we want to develop our confidence in God, we have to stop trusting in ourselves, as the Lord says in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 17, verses 5 onwards. Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in man. And makes flesh his arm, whose heart departs from the Lord. For he shall be like heath in the desert, and shall not see when good comes. But shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness, a salt land, not inhabited. Blessed is the man, though, who trusts in the Lord, and whose trust the Lord is. For he shall be like a tree planted by the waters, who spreads out its roots by the river. And shall not fear when the heat comes, but its leaf shall be green. And shall not be careful in the year of drought, neither shall cease from yielding fruit. Now, that's all Jeremiah 17, verse 5 onwards. Now, what God is telling us here is that if we depend on ourselves, we will be at a disadvantage. Now, you, you know, in this world system, most people just depend on themselves. But if we have confidence in God, we will always, in all conditions, have the advantage so that we will be fruitful and will enjoy the blessings of God. We must believe what God says and then, to the best of our abilities, act upon it. Amen? Now, we don't need self-confidence. We need to be confident in Christ. Now, some people mistake confidence they do for pride. You can be confident and still be humble. Pride is confidence in the wrong things. Right, let me give you some information here. All right, number one, true confidence comes from knowing who you are in Christ. Now, arrogance is self-reliance because of what we have, who we know, or what we may have done. Number two, confidence is knowing that we can do all things through Christ Jesus, as Philippians 4.13, versus trusting that what we can do in ourselves, all right? Number three, confidence is knowing our past is forgiven by God, 
and we are in right standing with him by faith. Now, arrogance is confidence in our works and our righteousness, according to Ephesians 2, verse 8. Number four, confidence is knowing that God is on our side, and therefore it doesn't matter who is against us. Arrogance is security in circumstances and our own resources, according to Romans 8, 31. Now, whatever you may be facing right now, The Lord is there for you. You need to believe these things. He loves you. He will show himself strong even through your weaknesses. But you must trust. And the key is, believe him. Amen? Now, in Joshua 1 verse 5, when God called Joshua to be Israel's leader following the death of Moses, he said, no man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not fail you or forsake you. If you need comfort and encouragement, start saying it and apply it to your own life. God is your God. You're his children. Your confidence comes in your relationship to him by speaking and saying what the word of God has for you, all right? Now, whatever Joshua lacked to carry out an assignment was not a problem for God or for Joshua. Do you think your problems are a problem for God? He's a problem solver, if you allow him through his word. So the Lord covered any lack through his promises. He said, I will be with you. Is he with you today? Yes, he is. He's in your spirit. Amen? His spirit lives in your spirit, part of his spirit. Amen? No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not fail you or forsake you. That tells me we're equal to anything, as long as God is with us, right? Now, you should say something like this every day. Quoting Philippians 4.13. I have strength for all things in Christ who empowers me. I am ready for anything, equal to anything, through him who infuses strength into me. I am self-sufficient in Christ's sufficiency. See, God is able, even when we're not. He's waiting for us to show confidence in him. Now, the Lord told Joshua that all he needed to do was to be strong and courageous, and this is very important, and fear not. Okay? See, faith opens the door for God's greatness to be seen through our lives. God's ability to work on your behalf is absolutely unlimited. Now, the Apostle Paul summed it up in Ephesians 3.20. Now, to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. Do you know what that's telling me? We could see that this way. His power in you has no limits. We have limits in the natural, I understand. But God can do anything through you if you're open to that. Now, the Amplified the Bible puts it this way. God is able to carry out his purpose and do superabundantly, far over and above all that we dare ask or think, infinitely beyond our highest prayers, desires, thoughts, hopes, or dreams. Now just imagine the best that this world has to offer. God is able to do superabundantly, far above anything you could imagine. That refers to health, accommodation, job opportunities, and any answer to your problems, anything and everything you could ever need. That's the truth. See, it depends on you how much you believe and allow his spirit to work in and through you. God wants you to live in blessings. That's his testimony. That's what draws unbelievers. How come this... 
lady, men, whatever the circumstances are, is so successful. What's causing that? Now, the important thing is to know is that he wants to do this for every one of you. God desires far more than you could ever dream. Remember, you get what you expect. All right? So make it a promise. Or a practice, probably, is the best way to say. To ask God for the best when it comes to your desires. Then thank God you expect exceedingly, abundantly above what you have asked. Because that's what the scripture is saying. That's quite amazing when you think about it, isn't it? Now, usually the vision of a normal person is far below God's ability to bless him or her. Okay? If that is you, try to fill yourself as much as you can with the word of God. It will change your life. And it will expand your vision, increase your level of expectancy. There are no limitations with God. He knows no boundaries. What's impossible with man is always possible with God. That's what Luke 18, 27 tells you. The fact that God wants to do exceedingly, abundantly above all we ask or think does not make it automatic. You must believe and always receive by faith. That means you stand on his promise for the superabundant blessings of God. They belong to you. You're in God's family. Don't settle for barely getting along or just enough. God wants you to have exceedingly abundantly above that. Now, it is his life in us that makes us a success with what we do. We mustn't be looking and being caught in adequacy or inability to do things. That's to get your eyes off the author and the finisher of our faith. If God wants you to do something, you can do it because he uses his ability in you to come out of you. Amen? That's the spirit of God. That's relationships that we have. He's the one who will perfect our faith. He will. Now, as we continue to look at him, it means, and study in his word, our faith develops. The more we see Jesus, the more we begin to understand his ability, it's available to us. We begin to recognize his willingness to use his power on our behalf because he is our source. He is our guidance. Amen? Now, he's in us. His nature has been imparted to every one of us. If we're born again, to be self-conscious means that we are more conscious of self than we are of God. It's a simple way to put it. We must not allow self-consciousness to restrain us. Now, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12 tells us this, and it warns us against this very thing I've just said. For we dare not class ourselves or compare ourselves with those who commend themselves. But they, measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves, are not wise. That's a good mouthful, isn't it? We must never compare ourselves with someone else, okay? There's no place for competition in the body of Christ. It's not competition. We should be all aiming for the same goal. Now, just encourage yourself with these thoughts I give you. Create your confidence as a checklist, all right? Give you a checklist, are you ready? Number one, has God ever met your need? Number two, has God ever delivered you from something? Number three, has God ever turned your situation around? He turned every mess I was ever in around. Number four, has God ever given you favor when you needed it? That's amazing, isn't it? Number five, has God ever caused you to succeed in something you thought you couldn't do? Hmm. Well, you see, if that's the case, he can do it again. That's how David encouraged himself. He experienced it time after time. 
with the bears, with the lion, with Goliath. Hmm. Encouraging himself with what God had done, and he was believing God could do even more. Exceedingly, we should be thinking for our soul, exceedingly, abundantly, above what we could dare or ask or think. How many of you know God is not a respecter of persons? You have to believe. You have to be confident in God's faithfulness to bring his word to pass. You have to believe the word of God. Make sure you resist doubt and fear because they come from the enemy. The battle of primary takes place in your mind. It's the first place that doubt and fear are going to show up when you begin to stand on God's word. For some people, it's like all hell breaks loose against you. Now remember, your time with God is your source of strength in this life. Don't neglect your time in the word because if you lose it in your thought life, you will lose the battles that we all have to face in different ways. For example, if you're standing on God's promises of provision to get your needs met, the first time a bill comes that you cannot pay, you'll probably stay strong, stand strong. You'll say, well, my God supplies all my needs, Philippians 4.19. But if a week or two goes by, and you still have not been able to pay the bill, you're going to get the thought, maybe it's not working. And at that point, unless you have developed your faith, trained your thinking, doubts are going to begin to flood your mind. And as soon as you get into fear, you can forget about seeing the miraculous provision of God. So what is the point of the attack? We need to understand these things. If you allow your mind to entertain a shadow of doubt, concerning, you know, the promise of God. So how do you counter that? Now, first of all, according to 2 Corinthians 10, verse 5, it says, you must take every thought captive to the obedience of Jesus Christ. That's your responsibility, it's mine. When the enemy calls into question the truth of God's word, do what Jesus did. Come right back at him with the scripture. It is written. So shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. It shall not return to me void, means empty, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing where I sent it. That's Isaiah 55. So you need to send the word out in whatever the situation is. Because saying that will encourage you not to give up when things look bad. Make sure you add to your faith the force of patience. Patience means remaining constantly the same. Amen? Now, Hebrews 6.12, it shows us how these two powerful forces work together. That you be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Now, through faith. Faith believes the word of God. It's the word of God that has the power to set you free in any given circumstance. Doesn't mean it's all instant freedom, but freedom comes if you stay with the word, whatever your situation is. So you must take that position which says, I believe God's word. And I am not moved by what I see or what I feel hmm. or hear. I don't care how long it takes for it to manifest. I will not be moved off my confidence in God's word. That's what we need to develop, all of us. Keep going, even when you think you can't. God has promised you a way of escape. So keep going and you wait for it. If you're in the word... Always comes true. It's not always in our timing, but God knows if it has to be instant or a period where your faith is growing. All right? 
Now, victory is just around the corner, but you never taste it if you give up. As you become strong in the Lord, the temptations that you've battled with become progressively a level weaker. Okay? Until they lose their appeal. And you begin to walk in victory more easily. All right. Now, this is a kind of a determination that the Apostle Paul wrote about in Galatians 6, verse 9, when he said this, Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Or we could say, if we don't give up. You will always reach it if you don't give up, as long as it's word orientated. All right? Never forget due season always comes. If you will not faint, you will see the due season of harvest that you're believing for. Now, things in the spiritual realm take time on the earth to put into place. There is a due season for everything, and a due season will come if you will not faint in your mind or your doubts. Okay? You're supposed to be the winners. 1 John 5, 14 says, This is the confidence, the assurance, the privilege of boldness which we have in him. He listens to and hears us. And if since we positively know that he listens to us in whatever we ask, that's good to know, isn't it? God is saying he listens to you when you're asking. We also know with settled and absolute knowledge that we have granted us as our present possessions the requests made of him. If you take the word of God and line up with it, any needs in your life, there's an answer in the Bible. Be in line with the scriptures. Stay positive. Stay in faith. You always win. That's the truth. But we give up too easily. You know? Listen, if you're in a desperate situation, God can move very quick. But sometimes it's a test of your faith. Do you really believe? If you believe the word of God, you've got the result before you see it. That's what faith is all about. That's what promises of God are all about. They're all yes and amen. Can you say yes and amen? Praise God. Well, have a great week then. Put it to work.